we're given some data. When you copy data from Excel, it's best to copy the stuff inside the table and then grab something outside the table. If you don't, it can be copied into a single cell of Microsoft Excel. And when you paste, always choose match destination formatting. Here's something you may not know. In Excel, strings of characters, text, are left justified and numbers are right justified. So if, for example, your data is left justified, Excel might not consider it a number. So one way to figure out if, if it is formatted as a number is to add decimal places. And so it is formatted right now as, as uh, numbers in Excel. I like to do left justify because um, it's easier to see the name and the column header. The thing I want to predict, I'm going to make that yellow. I'm going to highlight that with the color yellow, light yellow. And the thing that I'm going to use to make the predictions, in this case, winning percentage, I'm going to highlight that, I don't know, something like uh, light blue gray, right? And then I'll put a, uh, I'll put some borders in here, kind of dress it up. And I'll widen it out a little bit so we can see it. Okay, so Y is hot dog sales and winning percentage is X. We want to predict hot dog sales. So we got to run a regression. So I'm going to go ahead and move this over here. And then just that way I can use the screen for Excel only until I get my answers. So in order to do regression, you have to click on data here, the data ribbon, and you got to find the data analysis tool over here. Now, if you don't have a data analysis tool, you can go to my class right here and you can click on this link here to watch a video on how to get this to show up. If you have a Mac, you watch this video. If you have a PC, you watch that video. Also, you got to use, you have to use Excel that is downloaded and installed on your PC or your Mac. Online Excel does not have this analysis tool pack, this data analysis pack. Okay. All right. So I'm going to click on data analysis. And then I'm going to find regression in the menu. It should be identical. At this point, it should be identical between a Mac and a PC. Click OK. And then I'm going to highlight the stuff with including the Y. Actually, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to switch this real quick. I'm going to call this hot dog sales. And I'm going to call this uh, winning percentage. I'm just going to call it winning percentage, WP. I'm going to move this down here. And I'm going to move this here. Okay, now I'm going to go back. I want the, the names to be immediately above the values, right? I'm only putting X and Y up here to make sure that you understand that this is what we want to predict. And this is what we're going to use to help make those predictions, right? Let's go back to data analysis, regression. So my Y range is going to be the hot dog sales name all the way down to the last number in column B. My X input range is going to be the name winning percentage, WP, all the way down to, down to the last number. You can't include empty rows. You can't have any empty cells in Excel. Now, because I've included the name WP and hot dog sales, I got to click labels. And the last thing I want to do is I want to click output range. And then I want to click this box to the right of output range because I'm going to put the output right below the table. And then I'm going to hit OK. And here's my regression output. I'm going to widen the columns so I can read the values. I'm going to get rid of this stuff here. 
you click and hold down your mouse button, release your mouse button, hold the control button, click and hold your left mouse button, keep holding the control button down and you can highlight them all at the same time. And then you can go up here to home number and then reduce the number of decimal places to three. Now it's just a matter of translating the information into the problem. I have one degree of freedom for regression. The sum of squares is a pretty big number. The mean square due to regression. And then the F statistic. Now, I don't like calling this F. I like to call it F stat. So I'll, I'll change that name to F stat. I don't like the name significance F. Most regression packages call it the P value. And it's the P value for the F statistic. And then I don't like calling this residual. I mean, residual is the appropriate name, but this is the SSR because we have sum of squares due to regression. And we have sum of squares due to errors, right? Sum of square errors. So I, I like to change this name to errors. And I'll, I'll put my changes in red. I like to copy and paste. To paste in Excel, you hit the Control and V keys at the same time. To copy, you do Control and C. This value here, this is the mean square due to regression. This value is just this number divided by the degrees of freedom. This number here, mean square due to error, is found by taking the sum of square errors and divided by its degrees of freedom. The F statistic is just a ratio of these two. This is the area under the F distribution that is to the right of 15.075. So the smaller the p-value is, the more significant you can say the model is. Now you can notice that the p-value of the F statistic and the p-value of the variable winning percentage that we use to predict uh, hot dog sales, these two p-values are not, that's not a coincidence that they're equal. Why? Because in simple regression with one x variable, with one x variable, the t statistic squared equals the f statistic. So if I were to square that, if I multiply that by itself, I get 15.075, which is why these two values are the same. Now in multiple regression, that's not going to be the case. Generally speaking, though, if I have multiple regression here and I have a bunch of p-values here, if these p-values are generally small, that's going to be small. If these t-stats, if I have multiple regression here and these t-stats are relatively big, that's going to be big. And then one more last thing, the r-square is just the ratio of these two things. We take the sum of squares due to regression, we divide that by the sum of, square, uh, sum of squares total, and I get the r-square. Now, the R-square is just the square of the correlation. I can calculate the correlation of X and Y by grabbing these two sets of numbers and hitting Enter. And if I square that, Shift-6 to get the raise to, and I square that, you can see that the two numbers are the same. So the R-square in simple regression is just the square of the correlation. That's all it is. When you're doing simple regression, you want to look at the R-square. And when you're doing multiple regression, when you look at the adjusted R-square. We have the coefficients down here. This is the intercept. This is the slope. This right here is our model. And we have y equal to the intercept 3359.361. The slope is positive, type plus. And then we're going to type the slope, 31.341. We're going to multiply that by x. Now remember, y, what we're predicting here is hot dog sales. So I can call that hot dog sales. And then I can call this winning percentage. This is an estimate of the true slope. The true slope is denoted beta. 
So this is B1. It is an estimate of beta 1. And then this is B0. It's an estimate of beta 0, the true intercept. Okay, in statistics, we'll never know exactly what these parameters are, but we can estimate them with data. So that's what we're doing with regression. We're, we're building this model. Then we can use this to make predictions. The standard error for the two, the test statistic is just this, the, the coefficients here, divided by their standard errors. So if I divide these two things by these uh, standard errors, the corresponding standard errors, I get the test statistics. And a test statistic above two, by rule of thumb, is going to mean the parameter is statistically significant. The p-values here, let me open up statsdistributions.com. Okay, so first we need to change it to student t's distribution. It looks like the normal, right? They look similar. For degrees of freedom, the t's distribution is wide and short. But as the sample size gets bigger, degrees of freedom gets bigger, you'll see the uh, t distribution get closer and closer to the normal distribution. And then once you get above 100, there's no change in the shape, right? So when there's only one degree of freedom, when you only have two things in your sample size, it's pretty short and wide. As you add uh, observations, the T distribution gets closer and closer and closer to the normal distribution. Now, for our simple regression, our degrees of freedom are equal to four. We use the error degrees of freedom for the T distribution. And the reason why we do that is because how many, how many parameters have we estimated? We've estimated the intercept and we've estimated the slope. That's two parameters. And there's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six observations. So when you got six observations and you use those six observations to estimate two parameters, your degrees of freedom are six minus two. I'm going to copy the test statistic right there. And this p value is a two tailed probability value. So you see the shaded area here. And you can see the shaded area here. And our test statistic is positive. The area under the distribution that is greater than our test statistic plus the area under the distribution that is to the left of the negative of our test statistic, that area plus that area is equal to 0 0.018. That's exactly what Excel got. 0 0.18. That's how you get the p-values. The FP value is 0 0.0182. So now we're going to click on the F distribution. And then the F distribution, we have, remember what I said the F statistic is? It's this, mean square error due to regression, divided by this, mean square due to error. So it's a ratio of two things. The mean square due to regression has a, a degrees of freedom to one. It's in the numerator. And the mean square due to error has four degrees of freedom and mean squared due to error is in the denominator because it's this divided by that to get 15.075. So my numerator degrees of freedom is the one. My denominator degrees of freedom is the four. And for small degrees of freedom, the F distribution looks like this, but if you have larger degrees of freedom, it's going to be skewed. So this is uh, four right? And this is one. If my F statistic were, say, one, the area to the left of it would be 0.374. That'd be the p-value. But my F statistic is 15.075. It's way out here, right? So you can barely see the area underneath this blue curve that's really close to 0, 0.018. So that's the p-value of the F statistic. All right, now we're going to move on to our question here. Let me go back to the student T with a test statistic of 3.883 and a four, four degrees of freedom. So I'm going to use that to help me answer this question here. At a significance level of 5%, the T critical values for um, this null hypothesis, this is beta, the true uh, slope. This is the point estimate of the slope. And we want to test the hypothesis that this the true value is zero. In order to calculate that, we got to subtract zero from that. And we got to divide that by the standard error, which is the test statistic. I can use Excel to do this, but I'm going to first do it in statdistributions.com. 
So the significance level being 5% means what? In order to find the critical values, I can change this to 5%. And the upper critical value of the test is 2.77. This value here is a negative 2.77 because we have symmetry. Let's go to Excel and, and verify that. Okay, so I'm gonna calculate the lower critical value by copying this to Excel. So T dot inverse requires me to feed in the area under the distribution, right? The area under the distribution. The area under the distribution here and here adds up to 0 0.05. So T dot inverse asks me for the area under the distribution. Notice I'm dividing it by two, right? Because half it's down here and half it's up here. And I want to know what this value is right here. So half it's here and half it's here. So this is 0 0.025. So right here, we got 0 0.25. I can write that as 0 0.25 instead. This is my degrees of freedom. So I hit enter and I get a negative 2.776. If I type a negative here, right? I still get 0 0.05 here. We're going to use the values from Excel. 2.776. The T-stat is not under the white area. The white area says the T-stat is statistically indistinguishable from zero, which would mean that this is indistinguishable from zero. But that's not the case here. The T-stat is actually out here, right? It's actually out here. It's under this blue area. And that blue area is our significance. So with our T-stat being out here, we're under the blue significance area which means the difference between this and zero is significant. So what we're saying is this is a significant predictor of hot dog sales. It's greater than the critical values, right? The p-value exceeds the significance level. The p-value is the area that is to the right of this number, right? And it's almost here to four, right? So that's a pretty small area here plus the area to the left of the negative of it, right? So the winning percentage coefficient is greater than the critical values. The corresponding p-value is less than the significance level. And both of these indicate the winning percentage is a significant predictor of Mariner hot dog sales. This result implies each one percentage point increase in Mariner winning percentage increases because this is positive increases concessions uh, sales by 31.341 hot dogs. Slope is the rise over run. Rise over run. The rise over run is the change, in this case, hot dog sales, over the change in winning percentage. Now, the slope is 31.341. Because the slope is two components, the change in hot dog sales over the change in winning percentage, it's really hard to interpret this value here unless we make it two components. If I divide it by one, 31.341 divided by one is still 31.341, right? But this allows me to make it the interpretation. So what this is is saying the difference in winning percentage, one, when a difference is one, that means it increased. So if winning percentage increases by one, the change associated with that, the difference in hot dog sales is 31.341, right? So if I increase winning percentage by one, I'm gonna increase hot dog sales by 31.341. And then the last part of it is it says, create a scatter plot with winning percentage on the horizontal axis and hot dog sales on the vertical axis. And we're gonna add a trend line, the equation and the R squared of the scatter plot. And we're gonna, re we're gonna compare the regression results to the scatter plot to the results that we found here. All right, so let's do that in Excel real quick. So I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here. Now this is our X. So if I highlight, if I highlight these numbers first and then I highlight hot dog sales, Excel is gonna recognize these as X values and it's gonna recognize these as Y values. So next thing you wanna do, let me uh, get rid of the uh, shading.
Okay, so I'm going to highlight winning percentage in hot dog sales. These are my X's. These are my Y's. I'm going to click on insert. I'm going to click on charts. I'm going to click on the one without a line. And if you notice, hot dog sales, I'm going to put in here hot dog sales versus winning percentage. Then I'm going to right click on a data point, right click on a data point, I'm going to add a trend line. I'm going to make sure linear is picked. I'm going to display the equation and the R square. And then I want to I want to change this. I want to change it to a solid line and change the color to red to make it stand out, red for regression. Now notice the errors, right? The errors here. An error or an estimated error residual is the difference in the height of this blue point and the red line. If I square that, if I square this difference, add that to this dot's height difference with the red line and square that. So if I square this height, square this height, square this height, square this height, and I sum those squares up, that's what I get. When I, when I divide the sum of squares by four, I get the mean square due to error, right? Now notice, I'm gonna make this number, I'm gonna make this bigger so you can see it. Notice here's my equation right here, right? That's my equation. So this right here is my model, right? I have the intercept. I have the intercept here, right? And then I have the slope, the slope, right? And then why we predicted hot dog sales, right? Using winning percentage, right? And notice the R square is identical to that R square, right? The, the same, right? What else do we need to do here? So does hot dog sales increase winning percentage? Or does winning percentage increase hot dog sales? Hot dog sales do not increase winning percentage. If you look at this chart, you see a positive correlation, right? You might think that, oh, in order to be a better team, all we have to do is sell more hot dogs. That is a common mistake that a lot of people do. You have to use common sense and maybe economic theory to understand the flow of causation here. It's not that hot dog sales are causing winning percentage. And it's not really that winning percentage is causing hot dog sales. There's a confounding factor that's missing. The winning percentage means people are going to be attracted to the home games. And because people are attracted to the home games, there's going to be more people at these home games who are going to buy hot dogs. So the winning percentage causes attendance to go up and attendance causes hot dog sales to go 